All right. Uh, All right. Derek, yeah. how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm Where's doing the great. fireplace, man? You said fireside <laughs> chat. <laughs> And there's no fireplace, yeah. Derek. What is that, man? People gonna ask for their money back because they didn't get a fireplace. They don't have the fireplace. We don't have the fireplace, but we have the heat. We the, uh, you have the heat. <laughs> man, you got the heat. You just straight up. You yeah. don't even care about lying yeah, to these people. Yeah. We're gonna have a fireside <laughs> chat. Hey, people. Later, we're gonna have a Bentley giveaway. <laughs> you just make stuff up. Well. Hello, you, people. Do you want a yacht come Sunday at 8 a.m.? Yeah. It's a yacht giveaway fireside chat. Yeah. <laughs> we just say whatever we want yeah, up in yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. You just well, pay your money, and we'll just promise you something. Yeah. So well, uh, first well, yeah. of all, I want to thank uh, Butch Graves for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to come hang out. I really appreciate this. I love Black Enterprise. I never paid for it, but I read it <laughs> every month, and I felt like since I didn't pay for it, I should come and just at least I should be here. Yeah. Since I, but every year I said, "Wow, look at that! Look who is in the top 100," and I did it every year because so I could try to figure out who I could borrow money from, and I just loved it. So, well, black, but, black, black Enterprise 100, baby. So I'm so well, happy to is, be this, here. Well, this is great to uh, have you. I had the. Uh, the fortune of uh, being at your uh, studios a couple of weeks ago, and and you are in perpetual motion. You are, you know, the uh, the, the host, the um, the uh, the producer. You are the hype man. You do it all in one shot. And I but, rap too, so which is great. <laughs> but it's it's amazing. You've had a fascinating career. Started from a comedian to now owning the weather. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so I want to start at the beginning. Um, well, okay. Well, know, first I was an embryo, and, uh, <laughs> and I remember that it was warm. I was cuddly, and yeah, it was the best time yeah. of my life. I'm sorry, yeah, no, go yeah. from the beginning. So, so you, you know, share with us your beginnings as a comedian and what led you to going to the business side. You know, uh, as a kid, you know, I, I was born in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, all right, all right. Can I get a ride home? That's good. <laughs> we can carpool, get there faster, yeah. get in the carpool lane. Um, you know, I just remember as a kid, born in Detroit, Michigan in 61, and Henry Ford Hospital. Yeah. And this is the 60s, and my mother and father would put on these comedy albums. Uh, Flip Wilson, and Bill Cosby, and Red Fox, and Richard Pryor, and Slappy White, and they, and my, they would just, my dad would roll off the sofa. And I just couldn't stop playing them. And I fell in love with comedy then, at that point. Uh, 68 came along, and uh, very turbulent, yeah. uh, the riots. Yeah. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, in, in Detroit, and I was in the middle of the street, you know, playing baseball. And uh, next thing you know, my mother, my, my grandmother started screaming and hollering, you know, like I've never heard them scream or holler since. And they killed them, they killed them they killed him, and they killed Martin. And I never, that just changed everything. Um, I looked down the street, immediately within my mother and grandmother saying that, I was looking down the, the barrel of a tank. The military had taken over. Uh, the troops came in, bayonets, shut the neighborhood down, bless you. They just shut it down, and, and I, they started walking on our lawns. And I was like, oh man, they're walking on our lawns. This is definitely war. <laughs> and uh, it was shut down. It was curfew. Everything lit up like a Christmas tree, burning down, the whole thing. So my mother said, listen, I'm gonna, we're going to go visit some relatives in Los Angeles, my grandfather's sisters. Okay. And this is six, summer of 68. And we went to LA and never went back. Um, so my mother had me 17 days after her 17th birthday. So I tell everybody I have two high school diplomas. Okay. <laughs> and uh, she ended up getting into UCLA. Uh, and going to UCLA and getting her master's degree in cinema TV production. And because she was at UCLA working on her master's degree, she went to NBC and said, can I get a job? And they said, no. And she said, okay, can I work here for free? But what they really say is, can I be an intern? Yeah. <laughs> and 
they go, well, we don't have an intern program. And being persistent, thank God, she said, well, will you start an intern program with me? So she took that no and converted it into a yes. And converting that one no into a yes changed the trajectory of our lives. Because they said, yeah, you can be an intern here. So she got on campus at NBC and they knew she's really bright, really beautiful, and hardworking. And they said, okay, you could be a tour guide. So she gave tours. And I used to go with her to NBC, waiting for her to get off work because we didn't have childcare. I tell my kids, <laughs> this nanny thing is like new to this family. So <laughs> don't get too comfortable here, kids. Um, and so we, you know, I would go with my mother and wait for her to get off work. And while I was waiting for her to get off work, I was just sitting around in a studio watching Johnny Carson do The Tonight Show. And then I would go across the hall and watch Red Fox tape Sanford and Son. And then I'd go down the hall and watch Flip Wilson do The Flip Wilson Show. I'm literally watching Flip sure. rehearse with Richard Pryor and do the staging. And then I'd go down the hall and watch Freddie Prince do Cheek on the Man and Brian Gumbel's doing the local news and Pat Sajak. Brian Gumbel was the yeah. sportscaster and Pat Sajak was the weatherman. Then I'd go watch him do this new soap opera, not so new now, Days of Our Lives. And, uh, and this was like 1974, and I was a kid, I was 13 years old, 13, and I thought, what a wonderful way to go through life, making people laugh. And I said, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. I'm gonna make people laugh, I'm gonna have a great time, I wanna bring joy to people, put a smile on their face, and I don't care if I ever get paid. I don't that care if I ever make the, a nickel. That lot was the inspiration. So what was the transition to going into uh, comedy from seeing these iconic performers on that, on that lot? You know, I just said, I'm gonna, you know, I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start. You know, I used to wait for Johnny Carson to pull onto the lot, and he had a parking space, parking space number one, and he used to pull onto the lot at clockwork at two o'clock, and he'd pull up in this white Corvette and get out of his car with a, brown paper bag sack, it was his lunch. And I say, hello, Mr. Carson, good to see you today. He says, hello, Byron, good to see you, young man. And because he knew my name, because I was always, I was stalking him, yeah. I was by his part. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then he'd go and he'd, he'd get back in his car, he would tape the show from 5.30 to 6.30. He was back in his car at 6.45 and he'd drive out to Malibu. And uh, one summer, Gladys Knight and the Pips had a summer show six episodes, and they had a comedian on. And uh, I knocked on his door, and he did his routine on her summer show. And, uh, and I said, uh, sir, I want to be a comedian. What should, I, what should I do? And he said, oh, go to the comedy store. And, uh, and I went to the comedy store and did my, my little, I thought the comedy store was a place where you went to buy jokes. But <laughs> so, and they were like, no, you don't buy jokes here. You perform here, you knucklehead. So, and I said, okay. And then I got there, uh, uh, Monday, Monday was tryout night. And so they said, people line up early, so you need to get here early. So I got there at 9 a.m. And the uh, club opened up at 8. And I sat on the curb until 9 a.m., from 9 a.m. to 8 p. And uh, Mitzi Shore, God bless her soul, she just passed away. She signed me in. She said, you know, she said, how old are you? I said, I'm 14. And she said, okay, you can't be in the club because I could lose my liquor license. You just go stand outside and somebody will come and get you when I'm ready to put you on stage. And I said, no problem, ma'am, I'll be right outside. So I would go every, every, I'd go there every Monday, every day, get there like at 9 a.m. and just sit there and see if I can get a spot. And I just did that for years. So and finally I just kept getting on, getting on. And finally this guy came to me, uh, he walked up to me, Wayne Klein. Wayne Klein walked up to me, he says, wow, that was funny, who wrote those jokes? And I said, I did. He goes, you wrote them? I go, yeah. He goes, all right, he goes, that's funny. He goes, let me get your phone number. I know somebody might be interested in working with you. I said, okay, let, yeah, here's my phone number. It was, it was my mom's number, so, and, uh, <laughs> and sure enough, the phone rings like a week later, I answer the phone, and uh, this guy says, can I speak to Byron? I go, speaking. He goes, oh, okay, he says, my man, Wayne Klein says you're funny. 
I go, that's what I'm working towards, man. That's what I'm working towards. He says, all right, this is Jimmy J.J. Walker. <laughs> Dino Mike. Dino Mike. <laughs> And it was 1974, 75, and he's hotter than the pistol. I mean, Good Times was like number one at this point. I'm like, JJ Dynamite's on the phone, I'm 14 years old. He goes, well, listen up. He goes, uh, why don't you come over and you know, write with me and my writing staff? You know, we, we meet every Tuesday and Thursday night at my apartment, and we write some funny stuff. And I hear you can help write some funny stuff. And I said, yeah. I said, all right, let me ask my mother. And, <laughs> Your first and, agent. <laughs> and then I heard him, and I knew the moment I said, it's like, you know, the, that moment when you're like, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, and then I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I can't, it it yeah. I can't get it back. I can't get it back. But just like, maybe he didn't hear it, but let's just kind of act, play it off. Yeah, let's yeah. play it off. You know, so, but he heard it, and he said, and I, he kind of put his hands, oh, he has to ask his mother. <laughs> And then these guys started like, you know, snickering. And they were like, oh, okay. And then one of them said, well, tell his mother not to worry. We'll have cookies and milk for him. <laughs> and I thought, who's that knucklehead? You know, I'm not even there and he's heckling me already. So I asked my mother and my mother says, okay, yeah, you can go. And my mother took me to Jimmy Walker's apartment, which <laughs> now looking back on, I don't know what the hell she was thinking, <laughs> but it was all great, thank yeah. God. So she took me to Jimmy's apartment and I walked in and was, there was his writing staff. Yeah. And sitting there was David Letterman, yeah. who had just driven out from Indianapolis in a red pickup truck because he didn't think he was gonna make it. Yeah. And he wanted to be able to get in his car and drive back home. And Jay Leno, who was sleeping in his car. And we were, and, and Marty Nadler, who went on to write and produce Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days and uh, Wayne Klein and Jeff Stein and, Way and Wayne Dugan who went on to do Mr. Belvedere. So this is who's sitting in his living room and we sat and we're just writing jokes. And Dave and Jay was getting 200 bucks a week. 200 bucks a week. And uh, Jimmy said, look, I'm not gonna put you on staff and give you $200 a week. And I went, did that man just say he was not gonna put me on staff? I'm like, that's like, I'm a gazillionaire at that point. If you give me 200 bucks a week, he goes, well, I'll give you $25 a joke. And uh, so I sold him my first joke. And he gave me a check for 25 bucks and I didn't know what to do with it. Cause I had never seen a check before. And my, I'm, 20, I'm 14 years old. And I had a paper route. I was throwing the Herald Examiner, Los Angeles Herald Examiner, Derek, and I had to throw two papers to make a penny. I was getting half a penny a paper. I had to throw like 5,000 papers to make $25. So I got that check and I ran straight to the phone and called the Herald Examiner and said, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. My arm was tall, so messed up. The... I'm gone, man. We're over. It's over, so man. You were out of the Come get the sun. <laughs> Sunday paper was killing me. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was really killing. <laughs> it was really killing my mother because I was like, Mom, yeah. I can't do this. My yeah. mom got up at three in the morning with me, and we put the papers in the back of the car, and I'm throwing yeah. them out the back of the yeah. car. Yeah. And I had that one little old lady who got mad every day because I didn't get it up on her porch. Yeah. And she would call my supervisor and he's like, you don't, you didn't get it on Mrs. Anderson's porch. I'm like, well, she's got a dog. She needs to put that dog on a leash. So he gave me 25 bucks a joke and I still have that check, you know, framed because what happens, I went to my mother, I go, what is this? She goes, it's a check. I go, no, I said, I thought I was getting $25. She goes, honey, that is $25. She goes, you got to cash it. And, uh, and then they're going to give you the money. I go, but I, I don't want to cash it. How is your I, 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 I want that. I, that says to me, I have a future in this business. Yeah. And uh, so she said, okay, let's go down the street. I open up my bank okay. account uh, at Bank of America yeah. on La Brea. I still have $25, I think, in that, in that, <laughs> at that the Same $25. <laughs> same $25. Hope, I, hopefully I was smart enough to get interest bearing. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, he, and then she said, now go to him and ask him asking for the check back. And I went to him and I said, hey, I know I got the 25. My mom said, 
you would maybe you're gonna get a copy of it. Maybe I can get it back. I didn't know how it worked. And, he, and I'm not gonna cash it again. Just I did it once. I was trying. Yeah. So be assured of that. And he gave it to me, and I framed it. And years later, doing uh, the Byron Allen show or Comics Unleashed, yeah. I had him on the show, and I said, "Look what hangs on my wall." This was the moment where I knew I could make it in the business. Yeah. And thank you for giving me the opportunity. I, and uh, so yeah, that was that was the moment I started yeah. doing stand up yeah. and, and never stopped, never looked yeah. back. I remember first seeing you on a show called Real People. Real People. A reality show. You know, how did you get on that show and how did from that show make the transition from going to the, the business side? Uh, you know, real people. So I was performing in the clubs from the time I was fourteen. Comedy store, improv. And uh, one night Jim McCauley, the talent coordinator for Johnny Carson, caught me. And he called me up and he said, you know, uh, I'd like to put you on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And I'm like, whoa. And this is every comedian's dream. I'm 70, this is 1978. And I turned it down. And I was 17, I turned it down. And he said, why? And I said, well, I'm still in high school. And, uh, I want to get into USC film school, and I want to make sure I'm going to get out of high school, because that's not going to go over well with my mother if I don't get out of high school. And I want to get into USC film school, and uh, for me, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And when I do the Tonight Show, I expect to do well, I expect to get offers, and I want to be able to accept those offers because I have the freedom to accept them because I'm not in high school. And he went, okay. And I ended up being the youngest comedian to do The Tonight Show with Johnny because I ended up doing it one or two weeks before I graduated from high school, right? So I checked in, I said, am I gonna graduate? Did I, get, did I take all the classes? I'm getting out of here? And they're like, yeah, you're gonna graduate. I said, okay. I did The Tonight Show. It went well. And I, but I grew up on that set. I mean, I, that set was like home for me. When Johnny would leave, I would sit in his chair I would stand on his mark and I would read, because he had all his jokes on a cue card. So you were and I would just read all of his jokes. And I just lived in the TV studio and was very comfortable. It, it was that or go home and watch Gunsmoke and wait for my mother. So I was like, <laughs> I'll just do this. And I ended up doing The Tonight Show with Johnny. It went really well. And I got a, quite a few offers. And uh, I, I remember, the, that was, it was one of those mathematical moments. And I, they, they said, well, which one do you want to do? And I said, this one. And they said, this one, why this one? I said, well, I said, mathematically, and I was speaking math at 18, and so much of business and life and just everything, it, math is involved for me. And I said, There's, there are three broadcast networks, at that point we didn't have Fox, ABC, NBC, CBS. There are only three of them. And I said, there's 66 hours of primetime TV. And only, I said, out of 66 hours, this will be the hour that's different from the other 65 hours of primetime television. And I think that it's different enough where it will stand out, be a top 20 show, stay on the air at least four years so I can get through USC. And that's why I want to do this show. And uh, I ended up picking real people, <clears throat> and it ended up being number one immediately and changed the face of television and gave birth to reality, to reality television, which is why you have Kim Kardashian and Donald Trump today. It was real people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that at, was 79 to 84. Yeah, at 18. But there was an experience at real people that led you to say that you wanted to go into media ownership. Share, share that story. Yeah, you know, uh, I was it, was, it was, a, it was a great moment for me. At the time, it was my worst, one of my worst moments, but it was a great moment for me. And looking back, I was 19 years old. And they only had me for one or two years. And, and, and so my first year, I was getting 2,500 bucks an episode. And my co-hosts were getting 75, 10,000 an episode. Second year, I was getting 4,000 an episode. My co hosts second year, they were getting 12, 5, 15 an episode. So they only had me for a few episodes in the third year. And then we said, hey, can we get 
in year three what they were getting in year one. And they just said, no, you're out. And you're lucky to be working. And it was very painful to have someone say that to my mother about me. And so I said, you know what? And I was out. I was done. They replaced me, put a cute little kid in my chair. And people were like, what the hell happened to you? I asked. And you asked the same question? <laughs> yeah. yeah, OK, good. Well, you were the one. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I remember thinking, I'll never be in that position again. I'll never be in the position where someone says, you're only worth this. And uh, so that was the moment. That, that was the moment. That moment you and established that, that your own value, and, your and, own worth. And I was like, no one will ever be able to say to my mother, hey, your son is lucky to be working, and he's whatever we throw him, he needs to accept it as that's the best he's going to get. So it was really painful. And then I realized at that, that moment, it's not show business, it's business show. And I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be in show business anymore. I'm gonna be in business show. And so January of 1981, I went to, uh, and it was really cold. I went to New York City and I went to my first NATPE, National Association of Television Programming Executives. And I went there because it was all the people who owned and operated television stations and all the major advertisers where the business of television is done. And I've gone every year since 1981, every year. I've never missed a year, and this will be my 37th consecutive year this coming January. And, and so I went, and I said, okay, who's the best in the business? And they said, Al Massini. And I said, Al Massini. I said, okay. I said, where is he? He's like up on the 50th floor. And I went up there. It took forever to get up there. My mom was with me. It took half an hour to get up there. Yeah. And I uh, walked in the room, and he had his back to me because he was selling. He was selling a television show. And he had these, these, these general managers, these owners of these television stations hanging on his every word. And he said, look, this is the show. I'm going to, you know, and it was a, he had a pilot where he had interviewed, they had interviewed uh, Burt Reynolds on the set of Smokey and the Bandit. Now, in 81, he was the biggest movie star in the world, Burt Reynolds. And he said, I'm going to tape the show at 1230. I'm going to do a little editing, and I'm going to put it on the bird at 2 o'clock. And they were like, what's the bird? He said, it's, it's a new technology called satellite. And then he goes, satellite? They didn't even know what it was. He goes, yeah, he goes, I'm going to buy all of you a satellite dish, and I'm going to feed you the same show the same day, and each of you are going to run the same show that night. And it's an entertainment magazine show. They go, what's the name of it? He said, Entertainment Tonight. And he goes, when are you going to put it on? It was January. He said, September. He says, we're just doing entertainment magazine, 30 minutes a night. And he goes, this is the greatest show ever. And I watched him sell that show. And I said, I'm in. And I walked up, introduced myself, and I said, Mr. Messini, nice to meet you. My name is Byron. I understand you're the best in the business. i like to learn from you. Where are we going to have dinner tonight? And he said, I'm having dinner with some clients. I said, save me a seat, please. <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, we're going to go to an Italian restaurant, blah, blah, blah. So I watched him sell television shows, and I watched him sell Entertainment Tonight and Star Search and Lifestyles of Rich and Famous and Solid Gold and Runaway with the Rich and Famous. And I learned a lot from him and Dick Robertson, who ran Warner Brothers, and Michael and Roger King, who launched Oprah, Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, and I just they, stuck they by their side. They, yeah, they and Al Massini ended up becoming like a second father mm -hmm. to me. I mean, he was really, he was really very close to me. And I was very close to him, he was literally like a second father. And these guys embraced me and helped me learn the business. They saw the fire in my belly, they saw my commitment, and that was it. I started from my uh, dining room table. Started from my dining room table 25 years ago. Uh, and I started calling television stations. And I remember Al Massini, uh, at that, and he said to me, he goes, you know, I started 
my company for my dining room table when I was 33 years old. He goes, you're a baby. And he goes, you should start and just start where you are. And then I said, you're right. And I hung up the phone. I had gone out to visit a friend of mine, Dick Robertson. He ran Warner Brothers. And at Warner Brothers, he was doing about a billion dollars a year licensing television shows. And I was out at his beach house in Malibu and sitting on his deck, beautiful home. He's petting his lab, drinking, you know, mint, mint juleps. Yeah. You know, this is what rich people do. And, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and we're sitting out there, and Dick just casually said, you know, I gave away that show, HBO Comedy Hour, to a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours. I go, in, in HBO Comedy Hour was a once a week show where comedians were doing stand-up and they cleaned up the language and put commercials in. And I go, why did you give away that show? He goes, well, he goes, my salespeople are about to go on the road this summer and they're gonna go out with the first cycle of Friends. We have 100 episodes of Friends. And he says, I want them to license the, that show to the TV stations and I expect them to come back with over $650 million for the first three and a half years of Friends. And he said, quote, I don't want them out there on the road dicking around with a once a week show that only brings in 10 million a year. So I got rid of it. <laughs> and I just kind of casually got up, went home, and started selling a once a week show <laughs> and started dicking around. <laughs> so that was the. I was like, gotta go, Dick. Gotta go, baby. <laughs> gotta go. Thanks for the men, Julep. I gotta go. Yeah, I gotta yeah. go dick around, man. Yeah, yeah. I got to dick around. <laughs> yeah. I'm out, baby. Yeah. Yeah, but so, you didn't find that that process was as, as easy <laughs> as he made it out the No, it wasn't yeah, easy, yeah. but at least he gave me that path. Nobody, that was the thing, new numbers. I mean, like, I always say to people who work with me, I say, I don't know, you have to speak to me numerically. Yeah. I don't hear the words. You have to talk to, I always say, look, I don't know if we're having a conversation about $1 or $1 billion. You have to speak to me numerically. When he said $650 million, it's like, whoa, okay, and $10 million, I'm like, okay, that's a business. I, if he didn't say those numbers, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have clicked, right? Got to speak numerically. So that I went home and I started selling the show. And it wasn't easy, right? You're right, Derek. It was so, very difficult. I started from my dining room table. And uh, I went and interviewed six of my funny friends. Mm -hmm. So I went and interviewed Sinbad and Robert Townsend and Paul Rodriguez. And just interviewed my friends. And they were just on the set, walking down the street, just... And I made this one week, once a week, one hour show. And I called all, sat at my dining room table from sun up to sundown, and called all 1,300 commercial television stations in America and market by market, from market New York number one to market, you know, 212, you know, you know, Butte, Montana, whatever it is. And I asked them to carry the show for free. 14 minutes of commercial time, I'll keep seven minutes, you keep seven minutes. I'll sell my seven minutes to national advertisers, you, uh, and you sell your seven minutes to local advertisers, oh, local car barter, dealers, local banks and ranger. supermarkets, whatever it is. And I literally got 40 no's from every television station in the country. And after a year of sitting at my dining room table and burning holes in my dining room chair, I was able to squeeze out about 150 yeses after about 40,000 no's. There was easily 40,000 no's. And that was a year of just no, 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 no. And I didn't do anything except call, call, call. I started at 6 in the morning so I could start. I was in L.A., still in L.A. Started at 6 in the morning so I could start calling, you know, call stations all the way up to 6 p.m. So it was just 12 hours a day. Just And there were days I didn't eat. Day, it was just like, boom, just dial, 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 call, call, call. And uh, Tribune had said if I had gotten 85% of the country, they were going to sell my advertising, my seven minutes a week. And they would give me an advance of $400,000 to go into production on my show. And I finally got to that 90%. I went beyond the 85%. And, you know, I just jammed it in. Joe Ahern was my first big clearance. He was a general manager of the ABC affiliate in, in Chicago, WLS. 
and this is 92, 93, and uh, he was just a powerhouse because he had given the world Oprah because he had Oprah on at nine in the morning and she was doing a 50 share and they were like, whatever Joe's doing, we want to do it. And, he, and I, when Joe gave me Saturday night at 10.30 because Chicago's on Central Time, I was able to call every television station and say, I know you said no like 40 times, but Joe Ahern just picked me up and you know Oprah's doing a 60 share, right? And, and they were like, Joe Ahern picked you up and then I got uh, all the television stations. And when, when Tribune said, no, we're not gonna sell your time, I just thought, well, I'm not gonna go back and tell all these TV stations I'm not gonna deliver it because about two weeks earlier, uh, I had an incident with a television station, WHP in Harrisburg, the CBS affiliate. And when I got a sale, I would, you know, I would, my mother would send a, a one sheet to the, like a little one page contract and the guy would sign it and, and then she put it on a clearance list. And I checked the clearance list every day to see which markets were open and who, I, who, who did I have to go after and chase down. And I noticed Harrisburg wasn't showing up on the clearance list. And I called my mom and I said, where, where, Mom, how come you're not putting Harrisburg on the clearance list? And she goes, and she starts shuffling her papers. And I go, Mom, you have to be, she was on the phone at her place. I said, Mom, you have to be a lot more organized. Come on now, these deals are hard to come by. She goes, she goes I didn't get it. I go, oh God, I gotta go call this guy. And so I called him up, I said, hey Bob, it looks as though my executive assistant has misplaced our, yeah. <laughs> our, our paperwork. And he said, uh, he said, no, he said, no, I changed my mind, I'm not doing that deal. I went, whoa, because TV stations don't back out. And I go, what do you mean not doing that deal? He goes, no, 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 no. He said, yeah, he goes, I had three sales guys come in from Paramount Studios. And uh, I gave them the time period. I go, you gave them my time period? He goes, yeah. I go, why? He goes, well, they told me that you were calling me from your dining room table in your underwear and that the show will never get on the air. And if it did get on the air, it would be on maybe two or three weeks. That's what he said. <laughs> so I said, is that right, Bob? Is that right? I said, okay. I said, how many people did they send in from Paramount Studios? He said, three. I said, were they well-dressed? He goes, yeah. I go, yeah. I said, those Paramount guys are really well-paid. They have nice suits. They have their initials on the hand. It's like, it's great. They're great. I said, listen up. I said, they're right. They're right about a few things. I am calling you from my dining room table. I am in my underwear. <laughs> But they are wrong about this, Bob. The show's gonna be there. And because of what just happened here, I'm never gonna cancel that show. And I want you to tell the boys from Paramount in every studio that ever comes your way and tries to convince you to not depend on me, that they will never, ever, ever be able to say that with any certainty. Yeah. And so, and I said, and tell them thank you. So that had happened two weeks earlier and then S Tribune said, no, we're not gonna give you the money to do it. And I went, oh my God, now I gotta call all these stations. I said, there's no way I'm gonna go forward because of what happened with Paramount. And about six years later, I'm on my sales call. We have a sales call every Friday at 6 a.m., much to the chagrin of my staff. I'm the only one who seems to enjoy it. And, uh, <laughs> and they said, do you remember something happening with WHP in, in Harrisburg? Well, the general manager said, he goes, yeah, he said he basically screwed you out of time period, and he gave me the time period. That show now is going into its 26th year. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately knew that I couldn't run up to the wall. I had to run through the wall, and I had to deliver excellence yeah. so that they never questioned who we are, what we will deliver. Yeah. And, and keep that leverage on our side in terms of here's our credibility. We're, we're gonna get to uh, Q&A Q in a second, but I wanted to look at, from that was the beginning of Entertainment Studios, uh, which you had started with your, your mother. And as you said, you've never canceled a show in, in 25 years. How did you get to the stage where you grew Entertainment Studios to more than 40 shows, you have eight HD networks, and one of the comments that 
I've heard you said that we've talked about is that you don't chase audience, you feed audience. Yeah. Uh, explain that. You know, I think the you know for me, you know, you're always going to the next level, next level. I think the greatest asset I've I've had in my journey, and it's still a journey, adversity. The adversity has been the best thing to happen to me. When, like HP saying, this is what Paramount said, and Tribune saying, I'm not gonna sell your time. I had to go and sell my time. I didn't know how to sell advertising time. And so I was trying to convince people to buy my advertising time. I didn't know ad agencies, I didn't know advertisers. So I didn't pay my, you know, my mortgage, my, I went, my mortgage, I went in and out of foreclosure probably five, you know, 14 times over a five year period. So yeah, my credit was so bad, people didn't want to take my cash. So uh, it was bad. So they were turning off my phone, because I, this is before we had mobile phones, I'm calling people from pay phones. I'm like, oh, don't pay any attention to that truck. And, and uh, there were days I didn't eat and uh, I had to learn how to sell advertising. And finally, I, I'll never forget one time, uh, I called AT&T to buy some advertising. And uh, this woman called me up and said, hi, this is AT&T. I'm like, oh, I'm glad you called me back. I said, I can get you into my show if you give me your commercial in time and we get you on there. She goes, I don't know what you're talking about, but we're gonna turn your phone off tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't give us a check for a thousand, it's gonna cost two thousand to turn it back yeah. on. I go, let me make sure I got this right. I don't have a thousand, but you go, now you're asking for two thousand? How does that work? So I had to learn to sell my time. And uh, I went and I went on the road and I, I got to really know all of the chief marketing officers. And I went industry by industry. And I, first I, I sold to the movie studios and then I went to you know, soft drinks and fast foods and pharmaceutical and packaged goods automotive and industry by industry. And I looked up and I said, you know what? I have a relationship with every television station in the country and now I have a relationship with a lot of advertisers. And then I started putting another show on, another, 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 another. Next thing you know, I had 41 shows. And I just didn't stop like a, like a shark, like a great black shark. I just never stopped swimming and looking for the kill. And uh, I just kept selling and I just had this relationship and I said, now this is not show business, it's business show. I'm direct to the stations, direct with the advertisers. And once you have that, those relationships, you could put as many shows as you want. I could have 100 shows on if I wanted to. I chose to stop at 41 to move on to launching networks and buying companies. So that, is, that was the evolution. It was that, that adversity that really was the best thing that ever happened. It's like going to the gym. If you don't bench press, you're gonna be the skinny guy. If you start bench pressing 500 every day, you're gonna be the big guy. So that adversity made me bench press. That was my bench pressing every day and it really helped me a lot. I didn't, at the time I didn't appreciate it when my phone was turned off and I had the time my mortgage. I had this, I had a wonderful woman in Bank of America. She's like, honey, your file keeps ending up on my desk. <laughs> She's like, what's going on? I said, I'm trying to fund this TV show. She goes, I go, yeah, I'm paying for tape and I'm, I'm hiring camera people and I'm paying for satellite time. And, and she goes, okay, here's how it works. She goes, she goes, I, she goes, I got you up to day 89. She goes, after day 89, it goes to another lady right next to me and that's day 90. She goes, you don't want to talk to her. She's not nice. She goes, you can, you know, just go up to day 89. So I would play the float with my mortgage so I could pay for the show to get out to the TV stations. And I did, I would run to the bank on day 89 and pay the mortgage. And uh, it was that adversity. It, it just said, I know that whoever I go up against, they probably haven't gone through what I've gone through. And I have a constitution that's much different than a lot of my competitors. A lot of my competitors, no disrespect, their temporary hired help. I am an owner who has had to go through it like nobody else has had to go through it. And that was the best blessing I ever got in my life. Yeah. So, so it's the process of um, outworking it. Can we um, please line up? I'm gonna start taking uh, 
taking questions, and as uh, you answer, uh, ask questions, I'm going to also ask, um, ask you questions as well. Sure. Uh, let's have the first question, please. So, good morning, Byron. This is Deborah Gray Young. Hey, Deborah Gray Young. Hey, how are from, you doing? From, from Deborah Gray Young from, uh, from Eugene Morris, one of my first, av well, she's not there anymore. Eugene Morris had a wonderful advertiser named Walmart, and she was one of my first media buyers who gave me Walmart so I could uh, pay my phone bill and get and my house out of foreclosure. Thank yeah. you, Deborah Gray Young. You're, you're more than welcome. So, congratulations on the Weather Channel. I want to um, just switch for a minute. Can you talk a little bit about the Weather Channel deal and, and if you can, what your vision is for the network um, now that you are the, the um, CEO of it? The Weather Channel was, uh, you know, it was, a, it, it's a, it was a historic opportunity. Uh, a buddy of mine came to me who satellites all of our networks. Yep. And we have 724 hour HD networks now with the Weather Channel, we have eight. Yep. So I had read an article in New York Times, Verizon wanted to uh, you know, spend $23 billion, bring fiber to the home, offer 150 mm -hmm. HD channels. And so I, I went to Verizon and said, I want to offer you uh, 10 channels. They said, how many do you have now? I said, zero. They said, who do you think it? And I said, well, you know, I said, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, and my dad worked at Ford Motor Company for 30-something years. My granddaddy worked at Great Lakes Steel. 30 something years and these guys never called in sick a day in their life and they couldn't wait to get to work. And I want to bring that Henry Ford Detroit automotive sensibility and efficiency to uh, making content. A hundred years ago it was, the, it was the industrial revolution and today it's the digital revolution. And what fueled the, un, the industrial revolution was oil and gas, today it's being fueled by content. So I, I said I want to really be efficient like Rockefeller take it from the ground to the pipe, to the refineries, to the truck, to the gas station, to the gas tank, and make it efficient and affordable. And I, I really want to be a part of the digital revolution in, in a way through content. So when he came to me, and so, so Verizon said, okay, what's your thinking on that? I said, I'm going to, when I send a, a, a crew to Concourse de Elegance to shoot the car show, I don't want them to just shoot the car show for our TV network, cars.tv which we won an Emmy for, shoot what's going on with the resorts there for our travel channel. Shoot the chefs there for recipe.tv. Shoot what's going on with the pet community for pets.tv. Shoot what's going on with the celebrities. So I said, I want you to shoot everything in the ecosystem so we're more efficient. And they said, you know what, that's brilliant. We're not gonna give you 10 networks, we're gonna give you six. And we made history. One single day, we turned on six 24-hour HD networks. Nobody ever knew it, we just quietly did it. Now, then we ended up turning on our seventh network, Justice Central. We ended up becoming the largest producer of court shows. And we took all these judges, Judge Ross, Judge Hatchett, Judge Maybelline, Judge Karen, Judge Christina Perez. And uh, we said, okay, and you know, now we have seven networks. But it was not easy to get the distribution. So my friend who ran, uh, he runs uh, uh, Encompass, which satellites the networks, he said, you should buy the Weather Channel. I used to work at the Weather Channel. People don't realize how important it is. It's a cash cow, makes hundreds of millions of dollars, great cash flow, EBITDA, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he said, you should buy it. And I, we took a look at it and we said, you know what, we should buy it. And we closed and I said, it will help. It was uh, really uh, transformative. It's the largest cable network, not owned by a conglomerate. It's uh, the first cable network that's general market, that's owned by an African-American. And I always said, you know, that, you know, I don't want to play in the Negro Leagues. I want to play in the global leagues. And I want, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I wanted to send the message really loud and clear. I'm not in a, and that's a fine box. I'm not in that box. I'm chasing trillions, not millions. Yes. Yeah. And so yeah. I wanted them to know right off the bat, chasing trillions, not millions, let's do this. And so it's a great network because it's the only network out there that protects and saves lives. The government depends on it, farmers, uh, retail, everybody depends on this network. It's information that's essential to our livelihood. And I thought this is an iconic brand, it's an iconic platform. 
So I'm not gonna do anything to really change it. We might have a few cute little shows maybe make you laugh a little bit more, but uh, it's an important asset. And we have it in our portfolio, now it's eight of them, and it's a part of our strategy to buy other companies. And through acquisitions, because we're very acquisitive yeah. right now, we will grow our company and we will grow our top line and we will grow our EBITDA. Because yeah. once you get to a certain scale, and you're making X, Y, Z dollars, you become very attractive to financial institutions. Money becomes cheaper. And so that, that just was transformative to us. And so that's why we bought it and put it in our portfolio and you'll see us do more. And it was the same thing with our movie industry. When we put out our first movie, I put out a shark movie. And uh, because I knew they expected me to do something African-American. And I said, I'm gonna do that, but I'm not gonna do it as my first because I don't want you to peg me that. And uh, we ended up putting out 47 meters down. I bought the it off of Bob, yeah. Yeah, Bob Weinstein. And the highest grossing in the independent. And yeah, it ended up being, yeah, yeah. Bob Weinstein, who was my neighbor, uh, and uh, we couldn't get the deal done. And I bought, I said, Bob, you know, because I'd studied all the movies. I'd studied the numbers yeah. of all the movies. And I noticed that a shark movie had never failed. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna make my first movie a shark movie. And I told my acquisition team, I said, find me a shark movie. They said, well, Bob Weinstein has one. I said, all right, go get it. They go, well, we're trying to buy it. I go, what'd you offer him? They go, two million. I go, what'd he do? He hung up on you, what'd you, two and a half. So I said, you know what, he's my neighbor. I'm gonna go and talk to him. And, uh, and uh, we were out at the beach and uh, I went up on his deck and I said, hey, Bob, you got this shark movie, let's get something done. And he goes, you have any money? I go, yeah. yeah. He pulled out a chair, he goes, have a seat. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, he goes, what are you thinking? I said, I'm thinking two million. Yeah. And he goes, I already told you guys to get out of here with that. I said, uh, well, what do you need, Bob? And Bob said, I need something with a three in front of it. <laughs> I said, well, let's close this at $3. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, I forgot, you're a comedian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He said, you gotta put some more zeros yeah, yeah. on that. I said, all right. I said, if I give you, I said, if I give you three million dollars, are we good, Bob? Yeah. He said, three million dollars. He goes, all right, three million dollars. And then uh, I get, I got up to go back to back down the beach to my house. He goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes, I want some schmuck insurance. I go, schmuck insurance. He goes, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, all right. What do you think, Bob? He says, I want some back end points. I said, all right. All right, I said, well, get comfortable because I'm going to say something to you nobody's ever said to you. Yeah. He goes, oh, yeah, right. He goes, I've done thousands of negotiations. I said, I'm not going to give you any backhand points. I'm going to give you 2% of the gross. Every nickel I collect, I'm going to send you, every dollar I collect, I'm going to send you two points, 2%. Two he goes, whoa, never heard that before. I go, right. I gave you 100 times more than you asked for. I said, I never want to be across the table from you, Bob talking about why I spent so much money on hair and makeup for Mandy Moore or why I did this or why I threw a premiere party or whatever it was. I never want to sit across the table from you and talk about receipts. I said, I want to have a great relationship with you. I'm going to put out 100 movies over the next seven years. And you're a great movie producer. And this is a marathon, not a sprint. And you and I are going to work together a long time. And we're not going to get rich off this movie. This is a little bit of money, Bob. We're chasing trillions, not a few million. And he went, whoa. Yeah. He goes, you're right. I've never heard that before. Huh? Boom, shook my hand. He called me every week. I got this for you. I got yeah. that for you. Right, awesome. got this, right? You, you, always, you always play the long game. As well, I go to the next so question. I want to finish oh, this real okay. quick, right? So Bob got real quick. I'll share because okay. I want to go to on. Yeah. So Bob called me up. He goes, you know that movie that I sold you at the beach? He goes, it's on, uh, he goes, it's on DVD, it's on trucks right now. And uh, we're gonna start delivering the DVDs on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to Best Buy, Target, and, and uh, Walmart, and it's gonna be on the shelves on Tuesday. I need you to wire me the money right now, or we can't turn the trucks around. I'm like, Bob, are you crazy? We literally wired the money with five minutes to spare and spent the rest of Friday afternoon turning the trucks around. So they wouldn't deliver the DVDs, and then we I sat on it for one year and waited for the perfect summer date. And it ended up being the, the biggest independent movie of the year last year. And, uh, and, and when my guys came to me, they said, when you want to put it out? I said, I want to put it out June 16th. They're like, what? 
that's when Paramount puts out all their movies and all the big studios. And I go, yes, I know. I said, I want to step to them. They go, step to them. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what do you mean step to them? You know, this yeah. is Disney. You know, Disney's got Cars 3. I said, you know, Evander Holyfield happened to be a, he happens to be a friend of mine. And I asked Evander one night, we were, at his, uh, we were at his home having Domino's Pizza, watching Mike Tyson fight, and he was the next fight with Mike Tyson. And I said, Evander, how are you going to beat Mike Tyson? And he says, uh, stand up, I'll show you. And I had another friend with me, and I said, Scott, stand up, let him show you. <laughs> and he said, everybody's afraid of Mike Tyson. Yeah. So what they do is they step back and then he gets full extension and knocks yeah. their head off. He says, if you want to dominate your competitor, you step to him. Yeah. And he says, when I'm in his face, he's not going to be able to take my head off, and I'm going to frustrate him. Yeah. Well, clearly, he frustrated him and lost his ear, but <laughs> yeah. he frustrated him. Yeah. And he said he won't have full power on me. And I said, I want the studios to know I'm here and I'm gonna come in and take money when they show up to take money from those summer releases. And that really caught everybody's surprise. They thought that we would do a two, three million dollar opening weekend. We had $11 million opening weekend, held the theaters all the way through October and picked up 44.3 million. They were like, hey, yeah. who is this Negro? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Yeah, I'm, you know, Unfortunately, I've been given the, the cue to... Uh, to leave? To, to, yeah, to... All right, uh, let's go to our fireside yeah, chat yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but before we leave the stage uh, real quickly, um, Byron, I'd like to, for you to share with the audience and the entrepreneurs out here why now is the best time to, to start and grow a business. Do you have any philosophy? Well, you know, it's absolutely the best time because the barrier to entry is it's gone. And so many of us as African Americans, we have had serious issues uh, in, having, in accessing capital that was not predatory. Uh, because we kind of, we live with that matrix, what I call the four Ds. You know, first, you know, we just, they dismiss us and then they, you get a little angry about that, then they discredit you. And because you're frustrated, then they move on to that <clears throat> third D, demonize you, and then boom, that fourth and final D, destroy you. And uh, I recognized that matrix and I said, how can I work around that matrix? And I knew that we didn't have access to capital. If you don't have access to capital, then you can't buy real estate. And then when it's time to refinance 20 years later, 18 years later, to send your kid to school, then you're not able to break that chain. Um, small companies, that's the, larger, that's the largest employer of people in America. We need that. And that was my, that was my big request of President Obama. And I said, I only need two things for you from you because Coretta Scott King, I bought the rights to do Coretta Scott King's Life as a movie miniseries because I wanted to look at Martin Luther King through her eyes because I felt she was just an extraordinary person. She built the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Change. She uh, made his birthday a national holiday, the only American to have his birthday as a national holiday. And I just said, she's an unbelievable queen. And she and I became friends. And she said, look, Byron, as African Americans, we had four major challenges. Number one, end slavery. Number two, end Jim Crow, which I think was more damaging than slavery. When we were slaves, we were property. We helped make people rich. When we were free, then we were competitors. And then it was like, okay, hang them. And they said, number three, uh, achieve civil rights. And then she said, and number four, and she paused and she kind of choked up. She said, the real reason they killed my Martin, achieve economic inclusion. <laughs> and that conversation and that statement really, once again, changed my trajectory. And she said, it wasn't, I have a dream that got him murdered. 
it was the speech, the other America, that got him murdered. The other America is the speech they don't talk about, where he says there are two Americas. One America has access to capital, education, opportunity, jobs, mentorship. The other America does not. What does it matter if I could sit at the same lunch counter as my white counterpart and I cannot afford the same hamburger? Two Americas will not survive. We need one America. One America, not two. They killed him pretty much on the spot after he said it because he was pushing for economic inclusion. And I said, no problem. I'll work on economic inclusion. I will show the way. How, we, how do we do it? How do we pursue it? Barry Gordy changed it for me. When my mother and grandmother put me and my uncle in a car and said, let's go see where all these rich white people live. And I'm sitting in the back of the car and they were like, that's where the Fords live. That's where the Dodge brothers live. That's where the Goodyear family live. And, they go, and that's where Barry Gordy lives. And I went, what? Because up until that point, I was gonna go to Ford Motor Company with my dad or Great Lake Steel with my granddaddy. And when I saw at seven years old, that black man living in that neighborhood with an indoor swimming pool, I saw myself differently from that point on. And so I know, I know that those images are powerful and that as our children see us as entrepreneurs, it is the most powerful thing we can do for ourselves and do for our community and do for America. And so I knew it was important to do certain things, like file the lawsuit, and I'm not a litigious person. I've never filed lawsuits up until I got into the cable game, and I filed the lawsuits against Comcast and Charter because the Obama administration asked me, are these good corporate citizens? And I said, not in my opinion. And they said, why? I said, the cable industry spends $70 billion a year licensing cable networks, and not one penny goes to African-American ownership. And I had a guy ask me, a white guy, he said, well, why is ownership, we have African-American targeted networks, why is ownership important? And I said, well, I said, I just have my kids, my daughters, and I said, you have daughters, right? He goes, yeah. I go, so you have daughters. I said, so how would you feel if I controlled all of the media? I controlled how your daughter grew up and saw herself. I controlled her self-esteem. I controlled how people saw her. Would you, have, would you be cool with me having that control over your daughter's trajectory, her psyche? He goes, absolutely not. I go, well, why would you expect the same from me? Now that I have my daughters, I'm not gonna have a seat at the table, I'm gonna take a seat at the table. And I'm gonna have say on how they see themselves and how they grow up and how the world sees them because I'm not gonna leave it to you to depict them. And I think the most powerful person in the world is not the President of the United States. I think the most powerful person in the world is the person who controls media because that person controls what you hear, what you see, ultimately what you think and what you do. So this isn't just about money, this is about power. And so that became a game changer. And last but not least, what I said to Tom Rutledge at Charter, he said, well, you, you sued us because you wanted to take advantage of the uh, merger. And I said, Tom, business is a contact sport. And, uh, but that isn't the reason why I sued you. I sued you because you, when I looked at your board, you have 11 people on your board and they're all white guys. You didn't even have the decency to have a woman on your board, which represents 60% of the global population. You didn't show respect to women, let alone African-American, Hispanic, gay, Asian. 11 white guys get together every, every 90 days, look around the room and go, this feels right. I'm not, the, I'm not the bad person here, Tom. I'm just making it better. As a matter of fact, Tom, you didn't even have a chief diversity officer. You didn't even spend 80,000 a year, put somebody in a closet and pretend like you cared about diversity. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, Tom, if you really wanna know why I sued Charter for $10 billion, 
I said, look at the date of my lawsuit and then go look at the date of the newspaper in which you took a photo with Al Sharpton. And in that photo and in that newspaper, you said with Al Sharpton, you had an, a memorandum of understanding as to what you were going to be doing with black people. And I said, Tom, who is the white guy who speaks for all white people? Right. And I said, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I said, the very idea of Al Sharpton for me is racist. That you think there is a black man that speaks for all black people and you think it's him. I speak for myself. They speak for themselves. I said, Tom, how are you going to sit with him? And I own seven 24-hour HD networks. Cheaper to do business with him than to do business with me. And I said, and that's why I named him in the lawsuit as well. Because he's messing with a $10 billion conversation. And we made history. And I basically said, guys, I'm putting you on notice. And we have to do this in a way where everybody has fair and equal access and you're not minimizing us anymore. And that's where we changed history and we used Civil Rights Act 1866, write it down, Civil Rights Act 1866, it was put on the year, in eight, it was put on the books in 1866 to protect the newly freed slaves to make sure we had economic inclusion, government and commercial contracting, Civil Rights Act 1866, section 1981. And I paid my lawyers millions of dollars and I said, drop it on them and get them to the table. And now they're both in the Ninth Circuit and they can't shake me. I said, you can't shake me because you can't introduce a black guy that you're doing business with. And now we have a way of holding you accountable and saying, please treat us with respect and do business with us the way we do business with you because we love you and that's how we're gonna make America great again. With that, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to Byron Allen. <laughs>